I'm Dermot Darwin's daughter, very proud of the fact indeed I am. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this fine venue here which forms part of the Irish Fly Fishing and Game Shooting Museum. Um, proprietor, owner, founder, everything that's here is down to Mr. Walter Phelan here. Um, Walter, like Daddy, um, Walter, like Daddy, is a, a proud Atana man. They wouldn't live anywhere, work anywhere, do that anywhere, only live here. So it's great when you have everything you need around you. Um, the aspects we're going to cover in this, uh, sorry, actually, it was Watty who said to me, because we call him Watty around here, so you'll, you'll forgive me for the slip between Walter and Watty. Uh, Watty has had many different meetings and encourages many groups to come to this little venue here, which he built himself. So it was a couple of months ago, or maybe at the end of last year, when Watty said to me, Julie, it's time to have a gathering of Atana in Atana. So if we're talking about Atana, the only place to go is up to Dermot Dorgan, who's uh, probably one of the best local historians in this country, and I'm unashamedly biased for saying that, and I don't mind. So before I hand you over to Dad, um, I'd just like you to give a check on your mobile phones. I'm a culprit myself. Um, it's just that we have a little bit of comp uh, concentration to do up here and um, yeah so we'll make a start yes well good evening everybody and welcome and uh, as I have said when any time I spoke before I speak purely as an amateur with no specific qualifications my knowledge has been gained over the last 30 to 40 years from my interest in local history and my involvement in local history projects, which makes me only too well aware of the disadvantages at which I start when facing this educated and intellectual looking audience. <laughs> but, as the lad says, if you enlist, you have to soldier. And like our commercial friends would say, errors and omissions accepted, let's begin. Atana. In presenting a history of Atana, it is not intended to provide a chronology of dates from the first mention of this place in the 10th century Book of Leinster to the opening of Walter's Museum in 1999. Such a litany would be as boring as it would be meaningless. Instead, I propose to take the two main aspects of the history of this place, namely the Church of Ireland and the railway, because the main history of the village revolves around these two institutions. Because it was here first and lasted the longer, let's start with the Church of Ireland. A monastery seems to have been established in Atana in pre-Norman times. This monastery became the property of the monks of St. Thomas Abbey in Dublin. These monks, originally of the old Irish monastic order, in Norman times adopted the Augustine rule. They were still in possession of Atana Monastery until the Reformation in the mid-16th century when it became the property of the English crown. The first recorded appointment of the Reformed Church to Atana was that of Nicholas Madewell in 1652. From that time until the resignation of Canon Wills in 1934, over 20 men served as rectors or vicars of Atana. The Protestant clergy lived the life of a country gentleman. If his father before him was not also in the church, then he most likely was the younger son of a landed gentleman. The minister, particularly in later times, had a fine laid house with a full household staff, along with a gardener and perhaps a coachman, and if he cultivated the laid lands, he kept farm servants. He commanded the respect of all creeds and was a most influential figure in the area where he lived. His rather miniature duties were carried out to the letter of the law. As Goldsmith put it, in his duty, prompt to every call, he watched and wept, he prayed and felt for all. The succession lists of Protestant clergy for the various parishes show names mainly of English sounding origins who could claim no real place in the history of the area in which they served. However, Atana differs from this in that, that quite a number of its rectors have secured their place in local history and far beyond. Two of its rectors became bishops. In the early 17th century, Henry Ryder was bishop first of Cline and later of Killaloo. Half a century later, after almost 20 years in Atana, Edward Morris, who built the rectory, was promoted to Bishop of Austria. But it was Mervyn Archdall, rector of 1758 to 1786, who gave Atana a place in Irish historic studies. 
Mervyn Archdall was born in Dublin in 1723, the son of an English-born officer of Dublin Castle. From his student days, he developed an interest in history and became acquainted with Dr. Pocock, a renowned antiquarian, historian and traveller who had travelled widely in Europe, the East, and as well as completing a tour of Ireland. He became Dr. Pocock's assistant researcher. When Dr. Pocock became Bishop of Austria, he conferred the living of Atana on Reverend Archdall. And when he came to live in Atana in 1758, he commenced his work on Monasticam Hibernicam, an immense manuscript of some 829 pages, complete with index. Dr. Pocock had considerable periods in Atana assisting with the research into this history of the Irish monastic church. The room in which the bishop stayed in the rectory became known, even still, as the bishop's room and small walled enclosure at the bridge where the men worked on their books in summertime is still called the doctor's garden. The doctor's garden incidentally did have some less uh, academic uses. It was a well-known point of entry to the rectory orchard for generations of a tan of young lads during divine service on a Sunday afternoon in the autumn time. <laughs> The Monasticum Habernicum is regarded as a most authoritative source and is often quoted and referred to by historic researchers. When this was finished, he completed the final two volumes of Lodge's Peerage. It would appear that Archdall inherited this work by marrying Lodge's widow. She proved to be of immense assistance, not only with her late husband's work, but also in the completion of Monastic and Habernicum after Dr. Pocock had left the scene. It is to be noted that all this work was done in Atana. In 1786, Reverend Archdall became rector of Slane in County Mead. He intended to study the antiquities of the Vine Valley, but his head failed and he died in Slane on the 6th of August, 1791, aged 68 years. His headstone may still be read in Slane churchyard. John Ball became rector of Atana in 1794. He belonged to a well-known Dublin family who were not only prominent in the church and the army but also in legal and literary circles for a long time. His son, also John, was a well-known lawyer and lectured in law at Trinity College. In order to show that they had, as I say, this alleged foresight defence, it is to be pointed out that the Reverend Mother Frances M. Theresa Ball, foundress of the first Loretta convent in Ireland in Ratfarman, belonged to the Catholic branch of this family and was closely related to the Reverend John Ball. Reverend Ball left an account of the parish of Atana in the last decade of the 18th century, which showed the difficult conditions at the time. He died in Atana Rectory on the last day of August in 1800 at the age of 28. He's buried in the Church of Ireland churchyard in Bray County, Wicklow, where his inscription may still be read. The Reverend Francis Law would hardly deserve mention, but for the fact that his inscription is the oldest readable headstone in the Tanner Churchyard. He died on the 19th of September 1807 at the age of 32 years. The visit to this country in May 2011 of the American President Barack Obama brought into focus the two Kearney brothers who served as rectors of Atana in the early 1800s. Thomas H. Kearney, rector from 1809 to 1832, was responsible for the pres building the present church in 1821. But it was the discovery of his brother John's tomb in St. Canis' Cathedral that sparked Kilkenny's claims on Obama. John had preceded Thomas Henry in Atana. But the Kearney origins were traced to the Monegal area of County Offaly and one of the highlights of the US presidential visit was that afternoon in Monegal. So who knows, maybe next time he comes, he'll come in this direction. What do you think, will you be ready? <laughs> <laughs> An old weather-beaten headstone at the rear of the church in Atana has the following inscription. Here repose the mortal remains of the Reverend James Wills, D.D. Gifted with the highest intellectual powers, historian, poet, philosopher, he dedicated his noblest gifts to the service of his God and Saviour. This stone is raised to his honoured memory by his afflicted and devoted wife. There has to be a story behind this, and there certainly is, and one with a strange and unusual twist. <coughs> 
James Wills was born in 1790 at Willsgrove, a country estate near the village of Ballantor, about six miles from the town of Castle Ray in North Roscommon. The Wills, who were of Southern English origins, were Willamite planters on former lands of D. O'Connor Don. This is fertile country where the River Ray joins the Suck. The Wills were benign and popular landlords and mixed freely with their tenants. This gave James Wills his interest in ordinary people. The said James was younger son of Thomas Wills, landlord of Willsgrove at the turn of the 18th century. He was educated in a private school in Black Rock in County Dublin before entering Trinity College where he quickly made his name as a brilliant student and it soon became apparent that James was a budding intellectual. He contributed art against the leading magazines of the time and before he left Trinity was one of the best known young ad academics in the country. To further his studies of law he went to the Temple Bar in London but his brother Thomas who had inherited the family estate turned out to be a worthless waster and was declared bankrupt. This proved a serious impediment to James's being called to the Irish Bar, so he studied divinity and took holy orders. In 1824, he served as curate in a number of Dublin parishes and married Catherine M. Gorman, daughter of a county mead clergyman. They had in family three sons and one daughter. He concentrated on writing a huge volume of work, Lives of Illustrious and Distinguished Irishmen, and then his best known poem, The Universe. The Reverend Wills, his wife and family, moved to Blackwell Lodge near Bennett's Bridge in County Kilkenny, where the younger and most famous son of the family, William Gorman Wills, was born. James Wills continued his writing and studies and also acted as agent to the local landlord, his wife's relation, Bush of Kilmurray, and also to Power of Kilfane. In the mid-1830s, <coughs> Reverend Wills was appointed to the living of Paul Rowan in the Moonkine area of South Kilkenny. The house there was named Shoreville. Dr. Wills became very interested in his new environment by the River Shore, with its cot fishermen, clusters of farming villages, and unique customs and traditions. It was his study of these that brought him into contact with the local expert on such matters, Watt Murphy, sometime schoolmaster, who was also a poet of considerable repute. Murphy became a family friend and a regular visitor at Shoreham. From his frequent visits to the Reverend Wills's residence, an affair developed between him and Elizabeth, the Wills' only daughter who, in common with other members of our family, possessed an intellectual bend. Watt Murphy and his new lady friend often walked by the Shore River or sat by its banks on a summer's day, and obviously very much in love. But there was, of course, a colossal gap between them in, in social background and considerable age difference. Murphy was in his mid-fifties, Miss Wills was only 20 years of age. As soon as the Wills became aware of the affair, they packed their daughter off to England. Watt Murphy was naturally broken-hearted, and his woes inspired him to write his now famous song, How sweet is to roam by the sunny sewer stream, and to hear the birds coo by the morning sunbeam, where the thrush and the blackbird their sweet notes to join, on the banks of the shore that flows down by mankind. This song was out of character with his other poems, which tend to be of a violent and aggressive nature, earning him the title, The Rebel Poet. He sent his song to the Kilkenny Journal, which printed it on its front page. However, the Wills protested at this, and the editor promised never to publish it again. Forty years later, when Moonkind became a force in Kilkenny hurling, the song reappeared and became the anthem not only of Moonkind but of Kilkenny as well, and has remained such ever since. Watt Murphy was a native of the Moonkind area, where his father was a hedge schoolmaster. He himself was a man of culture and education, and also became a teacher and quite a good one. But he was inclined to get into trouble falling foul of the very Reverend Nicholas Carroll, a native of just Seskin over the hill there, then parish priest of Moonkine, who disapproved of Watt's regular trips to the local tavern. Watt was given a few cautions, but soon found himself dismissed from his post of schoolmaster, never to be reinstated. 
He earned his living from giving private tuition and by working his small piece of land. He was quite popular and had a lot of friends. The Whigs were also popular with all classes and creeds, but there was a minority of those friends of Watt Murphy's who started to make life unpleasant for the Wills family. Dr. Wills and his wife moved to the rectory at Kilmacow, which was in the same union of parishes. But this was only a matter of seven or eight miles across the country, so they still felt the animosity against them. Dr. Wills became rector of Atana in August 1861, and with his wife came to reside in the rectory here. He continued his writing and studies up to the end of his life, dying after two days' illness in November 1868. His widow survived him by almost 20 years, dying in Dublin in 1888 at the age of 96. She was brought back and buried in the Tanna beside her husband. A few years later, her faithful servant of upwards of 30 years, Nora Bork, was also brought back to Atana and buried beside her former mistress. The Wills family renovated the church and erected the spire, now Atana's outstanding feature, in memory of their parents. Watt Murphy has no spire or headstone. He died in the late 1850s and is buried in the graveyard adjoining Carrigeen Chapel, where a white torn bush that's kept clipped every year marks his final resting place. Elizabeth Wills returned to Dublin, where she lived with members of her family to her death in the 1870s. The Reverend James Wills, his daughter Elizabeth, and Watt Murphy are now forgotten. But it's a sure bet to say that the rose will not be forgotten and that her song will be sung for as long as the shore flows down by moonkind. Dr. James Wills had three sons. Two of them became well known on the literary and art scene in London. The eldest son, the Reverend Thomas B. Wills, entered the ministry, serving in the Diocese of Lachlan. The younger son, William Gorman Wills, was a well known artist and in his biography, written by his brother, Colonel Freeman Wills, is the following description of a visit to Atana in the 1860s. Atana is near Castle Durrell in the Queen's County. It was at one time an episcopal residence, and the house is a long, low building with a range of rooms, in our time disused, and it is unnecessary to say haunted. It boasted a deer park, but without deer and what was dignified as a lake containing several islands on which the swans nested. There was a well-stocked fish pond and a trout stream bordering the place. By the banks there was a pleasant walk shaded by ancient beech trees called the Twelve Patriarchs. A great ecclesiastical community of rooks, rooks held convocation in the tops of the old trees which met over the avenue and stood round the little churchyard like solemn elders. In vacation times, Mr. David Plunkett, an ex-university fast bowler, came to us and trained some of the village youths, who on one occasion defeated the redoubtable Eleven of Ballaragget. In this place and in the ancient garden, with its sundial and trim yew hedges, Dr. Will's last days were placidly spent. His death occurred in the year 1868, and he used his talents as counters in the games of advancement in the world he might have won a distinguished position, but he was a philosopher and like his son devoid of personal scheming and contrivance, which are so indispensable to success. He was buried <laughs> under the shadow of the little church of Atana. Reverend Percival Banks Wills, also known as Presenter Wills, a grandson of Dr. James Wills, uh, became rector of Atana in 1898 and served till his retirement in 1934. When he died in March 1936, he was the last Protestant minister in Atana. Canon Wills' wife was a daughter of the Dora Doctor Dudley, and they had in family five daughters, the descendants of two of whom are still in existence. The Church of St. Bridget in Atana closed for divine worship in 1989. The adjoining churchyard is still used for burials. The foregoing is but an outline account of the Church of Ireland and its more prominent ministers in Atana. So that's the first part of our... We'll take a small break before we launch into the railway. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
there's any questions, you can shout. <laughs>